Good morning. Today's scripture reading is going to be from Mark 4, verses 1 through 25. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. While all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and he was scattering the seed. Some fell along the path, and the birds came up and ate it up. Some fell along rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so they did not bear grain. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path. When the word is sown, as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky place, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times what was sown. He said to them, Do you bring in a lamp and put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and for whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you see, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has been given more, whoever, does, whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not, even what they have will be... Even what they have will be taken away from them. This is the word of the Lord. If you're in kindergarten through fifth grade, we have Kids Connection for you this morning, and, and Pat will be, be teaching. And um, so you'll have fun. We will be, I know some of you want to escape right now. We'll be checking IDs at the door. The rest of you, if you've not yet, please open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> so this was your, uh, or our, I shouldn't say your, our as a church. This was our reading assignment for this week. was Mark chapter 4, 1 through 34. It was a long one. And um, there's a lot there, more than we can we can cover in one service. That's why I ask you to read it. And we also invite you to be a part of uh, one of our Bible studies during the week. So we have a men's group that meets Wednesdays at 6.30, and we dug into this passage. And on Saturday mornings, we have a group open to, uh, to everyone at 10 a.m. If you can't make one of those times and you think, I, we need to start another group, come see me. I would love to be a resource to you, a help to you. Uh, maybe we can work, work something out that uh, I, I could be there too. But uh, we need to gather together to study God's Word because there is so much in it. I just want to make sure you know, as you look at the, uh, uh, your bulletin, if you look at the announcements, it says, and I try to put this out there every week, uh, next week we're going to read Mark chapter 4, verse 35, through chapter 5, verse 20. So that's the section we're reading next week, and you'll notice that uh, that has a lot to do with, with storms, uh, being on a sea, and, and bad guys. So we'll, 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 we'll get there, we'll get there. Um, but right now we're back to 
this, this long section, 1 through, uh, through 34. So I, I don't know if you know this about our church. There are some people in our church, I'm not going to point them out to you this morning, that uh, when they go to eat cupcakes, they lick the icing off first, and then they eat the rest of, I guess you just call it a cake after that. It's not a cupcake anymore. And do you know who you are? No, I'm, and they're, they're, you think, oh, the children. No, there are grown adults that do this, folks. And uh, I, I, I won't give you their names. I am praying for them. Uh, and I suppose that these people, and there's others out there, this broadens it, that, that like to eat their Oreos by uh, opening up the two outsides and then eating the cream filling first and then eating the outsides after. Am I right? Are some of you like to, to do that? And uh, I don't know if there's a law against that, but if you elect me governor of the state, we'll pass one. Because it's, you know, it's, it's like, if I've done it because people, you've got to try this. And it's like, then all you got is that plain wafer at the end. It's not, not as good. But if you like to eat Oreos that day, you'll be happy because today that's what we're going to do with this passage. So uh, Trey read for us, I think up to verse uh, 20, 25, uh, but this whole uh, uh, passage that we're, we're kind of going to look at today goes all the way through 34 where Jesus tells three parables uh, where he does some explaining in the middle uh, but the outside ends is where we're going to start. So this is an Oreo Sunday. Uh, and those who like to pull their Oreos apart, <clears throat> God bless you. You will like today because that's how we're going to start. So uh, with that in mind, because we're going to pull apart Scripture and try to find the creamy filling, I feel we need to pray and ask God for help for that, right? <laughs> so would you join me in prayer? Gracious, almighty God, we thank you. Uh, for your word. We thank you for the truth, and we, we pray as we normally do. God, give us ears to hear, give us minds to understand, and give us hearts to receive what your Holy Spirit is saying to us. And Lord, we're going to ask this question as we begin, and, and, and um, brothers and sisters, I want you to ask this question to yourself, as our heads are still bowed, and we're still in this posture of prayer before the Lord. Will you commit this morning to obeying whatever the Holy Spirit reveals to you or says to you through His Word? Will you make that commitment to God? And it's a frightening one. I don't know what He might say. But will you commit this morning to obeying what the Holy Spirit reveals to you, what He says to you, through the Word of God. Lord, help us to do that because we trust that whatever Your Word says, whatever the Spirit brings out to us, is good and for the benefit of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, the outer layers, if you will, of this passage are verses 1 and 2. That's the introduction. In verses 33 and 34, that would be the, the conclusion. So I want to read each of those to you, and we'll start with verse, and I, I guess it helps if I have my Bible. I tell you to get your Bibles open, and I didn't have mine open here. So let me just uh, read to you these two verses again. Uh, Trey read the first two to us. We'll hear them again. And I just want you to listen for things uh, in both of them that are um, similar or the same. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, and then it goes on to, uh, to verse 3. Let me just pause there for a moment. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus, it's interesting, uh, as you pay attention to Mark, and I did not know this before we start this series, but Jesus is in boats a lot in Mark. Last week he was in a boat because the crowd was about to crush him, so he gets in a boat in order to, uh, you know, keep from being pressed on. Here he gets in the boat. It doesn't say why, but many have come to think because it starts off with this crowd is so large, he wants them to be able to hear him, and he can't do it. So when you're in a crowd and you're, you're too close to them, you know, your voice bounces off the bodies. But if you can back up a little bit. And uh, those who know the geography of the area have studied this area. And there's different places they say, well, that's where he preached the, the, uh, in Mark from, uh, from the boat 
preached the message or told the parable of the sower. In fact, there's one of those areas, it's actually called Sower's Cove. It wasn't called that in Jesus' day, of course, but now we call it Sower's Cove because what they discovered, if you get in a boat and, and the way the cove is shaped and the, and the hills around the side, you get in, you pull off the water a, a, a few, you know, 40 or 50 feet, people can hear you. It's like a natural amphitheater. You could be standing 100 feet away and it would sound like, uh, like Jesus was having a conversation just with you. And the opposite effect works too. They find out on certain spots on, in that area, you can sit on the lake and if someone's walking by on the road above, <clears throat> excuse me, you can hear their conversation, which I would think that uh, um, that not might be, not be a good thing. They should have signs on that road saying people can hear you. So the point is this. Jesus gets into the boat here because he wants the crowd, everyone in the crowd, to be able to, to hear him. And now skip, keep your Bible open, look at verses 33 and 34. Again, I want to uh, read these to us. With similar parables, now you know what the, the two have in common. With similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them, as many as they could understand. So he was keeping it to a limit so that they might understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, his followers, he explained everything. So now we know the two sides of the Oreo are parables. Did you hear that? In fact, if you go to the next slide, we, we can see the comparison a little uh, uh, better. He taught them many things by parables, verse 2. He did not say anything to them without a parable, verse 34. And of course, verse 33 also mentioned parables. So we can call this uh, some call it the bookends, the, 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 the two sides of this, um, this passage. And what's in between? Well, obviously there's going to be parables and other things in between. These are the two outer layers that Jesus wants us to, or that Mark wants us to understand, they have in common. And we're not surprised by this that Jesus was teaching and teaching and teaching. So in, in your minds, go back to chapter 1, or you can look if you have it open. Chapter 1, verse 30, 38, I believe. Jesus had said this. Mark made it clear. I came to preach and to teach. So when we find Jesus preaching and teaching, He is being faithful to His Word. He has come to do what... He is doing what He said He would do, what God sent Him to do. He's, he's, he's like a farmer just throwing out seeds of teaching to the crowd. And he's being faithful to that. But there are going to be those who come to Jesus, who come to hear him, who are really there and they want to see a miracle, right? <laughs> they want to see a sign. And they're a little disappointed that he's out on this boat far away. And some of them are going to be uh, disappointed. They don't get to see Jesus perform a sign, but he's not there to do that, he's there, he's come, that his people, that we, that those who would listen, might hear what he has to say to them. What is a parable? Uh, there are those scholars, I didn't know that, there are, scholar, this, there are scholars who this is their expertise. They are parable experts. So they study parables in the Old Testament, they study parables uh, in the New Testament, and they study all the parables they can find that were written in the first century and before. And uh, one conclusion they have come to is this, parables are a puzzle. That's their purpose, they're, they're a puzzle. Now what's the purpose of a puzzle? To frustrate us? <laughs> Some are thinking, yeah, it's frustrating. It's something given to us that we have to try and figure out. Some of us like puzzles. Some of us could care less about puzzles. But the point of the parable is not to keep something a total secret. It's so that that thing might be revealed. And we figure it out. To figure out a puzzle, it takes effort, right? <laughs> It takes work. I've shared with you that our family, uh, sometimes we do this thing called Wordle. You ever heard of that? It's an online thing you can do. Uh, it was independent for a while. Now the New York Times uh, bought it. And uh, uh, we have, uh, I don't know if it's a healthy or unhealthy competition in our family. It's who can get it the, in the fewest number of guesses. But it's a puzzle. And there are times I just can't stand it because for whatever reason, it could be a simple word, it's just not coming to my brain. But I do it because of pride. I don't want my family to think I gave up. Um, but Jesus wants us to figure out these parables because he has something good for us. 
A parable takes effort. I'm sorry, a puzzle takes effort. It also, listen, it also requires help. You can't do a puzzle without help. Now, you know, some of you, are, 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 our ladies, are, you guys are passing around uh, puzzles, jigsaw puzzles, right? All right? And what's your help on the jigsaw puzzle? The cover, <laughs> the picture on the front, right? You can't do the puzzle. Now, some people can, right? Get, there's those geniuses out there. And maybe there's some here. But you need help. You need uh, the help of the picture. You need the help of someone who understands, the help of another person. And parables are the same way. They're puzzles that require effort, but there's help available to help us understand. And we're going to see that help is really the person of Jesus. Secondly, parables are stories. This is our favorite part about a parable. It's a story. But it's not just any kind of story. It's a story that uses something familiar to explain something that's unfamiliar or a mystery to us. And, and Jesus is telling parables about farming. Because in the first century, everybody was a farmer of some type. They knew farming. They got farming. Today, if Jesus were giving us these parables, he wouldn't use farming. He would probably use shopping, right? <laughs> a man went out to the mall. <laughs> a woman logged on to her Amazon account. And then that's how the parables would begin. He gets something we're familiar with. But he's, giving, he's starting with something familiar because he wants his desire is to we come to understand this thing that is unfamiliar, the kingdom of God. Jesus wants us to know the kingdom of God. And the only person who can reveal to us the mystery or the secrets of the kingdom of God, and by the way, this phrase in this passage, remember we're dealing with Mark 1 through Mark 34, and in that passage, you find this mention of the kingdom of God three times. And the only one who can reveal to us the secrets of the kingdom of God is the king. <laughs> and that's what Jesus has come to do. So now we know the outside. We have, we have pulled apart the Oreo. Should I ask for forgiveness for that? I don't know. We pulled apart the Oreo. We have the two sides. They are parables. We understand what a parable is. And now, some of you are going, finally, it's time to get to the, the delicious inside, the creamy middle. And this is, this comes, I think it's actually in a couple places, but mainly we're going to focus on verses 10 through, so keep your Bibles open, verses 10 through 12. And verses 10 through 12 come right between Jesus telling of the parable of the sower and his explanation of the parable of the sower. Do you see that? So it's kind of like, I guess, we're, well, maybe there's a double-stuffed Oreo in here somewhere we can figure out. But here's the meat of the cream. Verses 10, uh, I'm going to read verses 10 through 12 for us. Sorry, I'm actually just going to read verses, yeah, we'll do it all. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. And he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. So that, and he's quoting from Isaiah 6, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. At first glance, it sounds like Jesus is saying the secret, the explanation is only for some people. So at first glance, we hear, oh, it sounds like Jesus is saying the explanation is only for some people. And that's true. The secrets of the kingdom of God are only, according to Jesus, for some people. Also at first glance, it seems like Jesus is saying, I want some of you to know, but I don't want everyone to know. That's not true. The fact is, Jesus wants everyone to know, but only some people will come to know. And it's important here when we, when we read this, because when you heard this, uh, Trey read it, and hopefully you read it this week, and when I read it now, you thought, oh, that's bad. Why would Jesus want some to be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding? Doesn't he want them to turn and be forgiven? Why does he say, oh, we don't want them to turn and be forgiven, that they might turn and be forgiven? It would be a bad thing. And here's a big point we need to remember when we're reading Scripture is that God can be sarcastic. 
We sometimes miss sarcasm when it comes to, to the Bible, when it comes to the Old Testament. It's there uh, and in the New Testament. And this passage, which is, you can find in similar form in Isaiah chapter 6, it's sarcastic then. And Jesus is being sarcastic here. It's, it's ironic because we're good at sarcasm, right? <laughs> Some of you are going, yeah, sarcasm is my favorite form of, of humor. We, it's in, in, our, in the books we read, in the sitcoms that we watch, sarcasm is all over the place. Like when someone messes up, we say, hey, nicely done, good job, and we're being sarcastic, right? Well done, genius. We used to do this one in sports all the time. Nice move, x lax when they would do something and, and mess up, Right? We know sarcasm. Why do we think that Jesus can't be sarcastic? And it would help here. I think one thing that helps, if you look at the end of verse 12, if we add this one phrase, we'll get it. If we would just add uh, the phrase, and I don't know if I wrote it down for you, um, and, uh, and we wouldn't want that, would we? So listen, verse 12. So that they might be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. And we wouldn't want that, would we? Now do you get the sarcasm? <laughs> Jesus wants them. He's desperate for people to hear. That's why he gets out on a boat, so that they can all listen to him. He doesn't see the crowd and run away. He sees the crowd and says, how can I get them all to hear my voice? He wants them to hear. He wants everyone to understand. And he makes himself available to everyone who wants to understand, to those who stick around for the explanation. And there is the problem. Not everyone wants to understand because many lack the hunger, lack the desire, lack the conviction to seek to understand what Jesus is really saying. There are those who stick around. If you looked at this verse carefully, verse 10, you'll see that. It says, When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked about the parables. Now, some of your versions may say when, when uh, he was by himself uh, or with his followers, uh, and, and the twelve. But there's a distinction being made here. So, and it's interesting, the NIV uh, capitalizes the twelve because it, became, it became kind of a term for those twelve apostles that Jesus chose. So who, who's with him? The twelve. But there's this other group that's not identified. And it simply says, and, and I think this is the, the NIV has the best translation here, um, those who were around him in close proximity. Meaning, those who stuck around waiting for Jesus to get off the boat. Because <laughs> he's on the boat, you're hearing, he's like, oh man, I came to see some miracles. But nobody can get to him, none of the, the people sit can get to him. I got better things to do. But those who stuck around until Jesus got off the boat, they got to hear the explanation to the parable of the sower. You following? He wants them all to hear. But they don't all want to hear. It's those who stick around, those who stay afterward, those who, who seek out the truth, those who uh, wait for the boat to come back, those who read God's Word, those who study together. They get to understand. And those who stick around become insiders. I don't think there's a person born who, when you understand what it means to be an insider in certain situations, doesn't want to be an insider. Don't you all want to be insiders in something? I mean, we have this thing in our nation now called insider trading, and we know it's bad. But if someone has some good information about the stock, stock market and they got an insider uh, stuff, you listen, right? Now, they may be lying. It may not be a good idea to follow through, but we want to be insiders. And Jesus wants us all to be insiders, but only those who stick around are insiders. Look at verse 10. The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. Who are those on the outside? If you're going to understand Mark, you have to sometimes jump back and forth because Jesus uses these terms more than once. So with your Bible open, just glance real quickly back at chapter 3. 
In my Bible, it's on the same page. Chapter 3, look at verse 32. A crowd was sitting around him. Does that sound familiar? Around him. That same word there. It's the word uh, petty. It means around, about, proximity to. It can also be, uh, mean follower. They were sitting around Jesus. Now, you've been, many of you have been around long enough to know that when, when a rabbi uh, uh, teaches, those around him, they, when they sit down uh, and he's teaching them, he gets to sit down too, which I don't know how pastors, preachers today, we have to stand up. It's not fair, huh, Becky? Right? Uh, but Jesus got to sit when he teaches. But whenever you read someone sitting at Jesus' feet or sitting around Jesus, it meant that they, he was the rabbi and they had become his followers, his disciples. And so those on the inside, um, verse 32, a crowd was sitting around him. They told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Uh Uh-oh. What did Mark just tell us? Are Jesus' mother and brothers on the inside or are they on the outside? There was a time early on in the Gospels, early on in Jesus' life, when they were on the outside and that broke his heart. And he asked the question, um, uh, who are my mother and brothers? And he asked, look at those seated in a circle around him, verse 34, and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my mother and brother and sister. Those on the outside want Jesus, hey, come, this is what his family was doing, come, come home with us, come follow us. Come, come, come make our lives easier by stopping this, this crazy charade of yours, Jesus. And Jesus says, they're on the outside. And, and just, just so you know, we, we, good news that uh, we know that uh, uh, Mary and at least two of Jesus' brothers uh, came to, to know him, possibly three, because I think there are, are three different names mentioned um, of his brothers in the New Testament. But those on the inside are sticking near Jesus to get the explanations, to get the deeper knowledge. They want to know. And the question for us this morning is, where are you? Are you on the inside or the outside? Are you seeking the deeper truth, the greater truth of this master teacher, Jesus Christ, to know the secrets of his kingdom? And here's the problem with the secrets of the kingdom is that uh, it's not the only kingdom around. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of this world and there's the kingdom of me. And there are certain rules I live by for the kingdom of me and there are certain rules I live by for the kingdom of this world. And Jesus says... You've got to toss those out. And I'm going to give you the secrets of the true kingdom, the kingdom of God. And this question is laid before us. Where are you? Are you on the inside or the outside? Where do you want to be? Where is the Spirit calling you to be? One of those outsiders who can hear Jesus but aren't really getting it? Or an insider who is seeking to know these secrets so they can get what Jesus And the Spirit of God is saying, truly saying to them. And the choice and the responsibility to stick around is placed on us. It's the next slide, J.D. The choice, the responsibility to stick around and listen falls solely on you and I. The invitation is there, but the choice is ours to become an insider or not. There is here in this, in this parable, I know some of you are going to get really excited, uh, a double-stuffed Oreo. Because we looked at one creamy filling, and there's an, actually another creamy filling that comes uh, in this. And you're going, how come we're not looking at the parables? And I'm telling you, look at the parables. Do it in your study group. We just don't have time. I wish we did this morning. But there are, there are two cream fillings in here. And, and I, don't ha- I do not have a picture of a double-stuffed Oreo because I knew I would lose your attention after that. That's all we'd be thinking of. But if you, if you go now to verse uh, 21, Jesus has some more insider information. Um, he said to them, I'm going to read verse 21 and 22. He said to them, do you bring a lamp and put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought into the open. He doesn't want to keep these secrets of the kingdom a secret. He wants you to see them. But you have to uncover the bowl. The choice is ours. We can keep Jesus' words closed. <laughs> we, can keep, we can cover His light. And then we don't have to worry about the, being confronted with the secrets of the kingdom. 
or we can choose to let his light shine on us. Look at verse 23. This comes right in the middle of these, 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 two, uh, uh, these five verses here. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. If anyone wants to be on the inside, let them come. Verse 24 and 25, Jesus goes on. Consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away. Consider carefully what you listen to. Consider carefully what you hear. Jesus is saying, are you listening? Do measure yourself. How much, how well are you listening to the Word of God in your life? I don't know about you, when I think of, of measuring something, I, I think of a spigot turning on the water. And uh, I remember the days before you, you had, um, you know, I guess they always had, but you, you know nowadays water pressure is a lot lower than it used to be. <laughs> remember when you could turn on a hose and it would just, you know, the spigot, and it would just, water would go everywhere. And Jesus is saying your measure, how, how, how high you turn on that hose is how much of the, the knowledge of the kingdom I will give you. If you let just it drip out, then that's all you're going to get. But if you want more, I'll let you turn that nozzle up all the way. And you can be covered and filled all over with the knowledge of the kingdom. And there's a warning here too. Because if you turn off the spigot, if you turn off, if you stop listening, then even what you have already received can be taken from you. Are you hearing this? I realize this is kind of a, a reverse message this morning. Because usually we talk about the parables. But we are, we are taking uh, this passage from Mark and looking at the insider information that's put in between these parables. There's three parables here. One parable has an explanation. We know that in, from verse 34 that Jesus chose to explain all the parables, but Mark just, you know, Mark, Mark is an economist of words. He doesn't use a lot. And so he's only showing, giving us the explanation of, of one parable right here. He who has ears, Jesus has said, and this is also said twice in this passage, let them hear, the choice is ours. There are two main actions in this, this parable today. I'm sorry, in this passage. There are two actions. There's the action of speaking and teaching. Jesus does that. And there's the action of, of listening and hearing. And if you were to go through, and uh, I, I do this for my study, and highlight all the words and terms and phrases that have to do with teaching and speaking, and then you highlight all the words and terms that have to do with listening and hearing and understanding. There's over 20. In the NASB, I counted 23. But I noticed, uh, actually, I counted 22. And this morning, I noticed, oops, I was, I was wrong. <laughs> there was a, another one. I may have missed some. There are two actions. One belongs to Jesus. He's the one teaching. You may have noticed when you're hearing the passage, it kept saying, and he was saying to them, and he was saying to them, Jesus said to them, and if you were writing an essay for school, I know that brings up bad memories for some of you, your teacher would have marked you down. You don't need to keep saying, and he was saying. But Mark is doing that to show us that Jesus is the one teaching and teaching in overflow, like scattering the seed. And then the, other, the second action here is our responsibility. Are you hearing this? Jesus has fulfilled his, his responsibility. Our responsibility is to listen, to hear, to put on our listening ears, to receive, to seek, to understand, to accept. That's on us. And I think, church, there are times where we just, we get, it, we get this wrong. We think God will give us the understanding when he wants us to have it. He'll just make our brains understand. But that's not the way God works. The way God works is He gives us understanding as we seek it, as we, we stick around, as we search it out. Whoever has ears, it's placed on us. Let them hear. Uh, there's a, uh, um, a theologian, his name's Roger Olson. He, he wrote a, a popular book um, called Questions to Your Answers. Uh, but the subtitle of the book, which is the one he wanted to, is this. A journey from folk religion to examine faith. And he takes on different beliefs that we tend to, to have as Christians and say, oh yeah, that's, that's true. And he says, no, you've got to think about this. Is it really true? 
And, and one of those he takes on early in the book is this. God can do anything. We say that. God can do anything. We sing about it. Some songs say, God can do anything. But does the Bible teach that? Is that true? Now, now it is true. Nothing is impossible with God. We know that. That's Scripture. But can God do anything? Can He sin? Can He lie? Can He go back in time and change the past? Can He force someone with free will to do something they don't want to do? And in all of Scripture, we don't have any evidence that that's true. The truth is God can't do anything. And when we believe God can do anything, then we'll believe that God can, can just make us understand or make us believe when He's ready to. And again, that's not true. The truth is, as Mark has explained it, is that Jesus will, through the Holy Spirit, give understanding to those who seek, who, those who take the responsibility on themselves to stick around and listen. Sometimes I like this picture. It wasn't, I didn't come up with it. It's, it's, a, it's an old one. It was given to me. I'm going to say the gentleman that did it because I, I can remember uh, learning. I think his name was Bill Larson. It was, it was, this was so long ago. As I get older, you guys know this, then those names disappear. But he told this, this story. It's like, you know, Jesus is always willing to teach you. Picture a room in your house, a room that's not, not used very often. If you don't have one of those rooms, then add, do it, uh, you know, a remodel right now in your brain and add it. Could be a den or a sitting room like they, they used to have or a spare bedroom. And it's a room that you have to walk by every day. It's on your way out of the house. So you either have to walk by it from your bedroom to get out of the house or from the kitchen to get out of the house. And the door to that room is always open. And Jesus is always there available. And saying, come, sit with me. Let me teach you. <laughs> Let me share with you the truth. And we all know how our days go, right? We zoom out the door. And I think the invitation that Jesus gives to us is this. I'm not asking you to pause and put off your whole day and sit there with me. But just come in for a little bit. Just step through the doorway. You don't even have to come sit down. And as you begin to hear through reading God's Word and studying together with others, the secrets of the kingdom, as, as the Spirit begins to reveal to you and speak to you, you will find yourselves wanting more and realize it's good to be an insider and take that responsibility. Amen? I'm going to invite you to stand with me now as we close the message in prayer. When I'm done praying, I'll have the, the worship team uh, may come forward. <clears throat> Let's bow our heads. Uh, in the beginning of the, of the message, I, I asked you to just say, God, whatever your spirit reveals to me or is speaking to me today, I will do. Have you heard him? Have you heard him? How will you put legs to what the spirit has said to you? How will you obey? Will you go and do that? Lord Jesus in heaven, we thank you for the wonderful parables uh, that you told to us, Jesus. And they are, are worthy... <clears throat> Of, uh, of weeks and months of, of study. <laughs> but this morning we have pulled out what Mark wanted us, I believe, to, to pull out. One of, the, one of the things, anyways. This insider information, this cream filling. That we need to take responsibility to be those who are seekers and learners and receivers of your, your deeper truths of the secrets of the kingdom of God that we may live them out. And so we confess to you right now. Perhaps we've just not given time to it. Perhaps we haven't had that conviction. Perhaps we just you know, don't care to stick around. We weren't getting what we wanted when we heard the message from the boat, and so we, we left. Renew in us a hunger and a desire to know so that we can live out the secrets of the kingdom of God. And Lord, I pray for each of us here today that as we pause, as we put our foot in that doorway, Jesus, of the room where you are, are sitting waiting to teach us, as we listen to some of the insider information, 
that we would allow your Holy Spirit to work on us, convict us, and obey what light you reveal so that you may grow our hunger and our conviction of our responsibility to seek out your word and your truth. In your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen.